Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we're doing a mental and verbal inventory check and audit to become more aware of what we're passing down and what we're passing around. Where do your ideas and opinions come from? How are your biases formed? Are we as open and accepting to traits and traditions as receiving and re-gifting grandma's china? Or have we installed solid filtering systems protecting our minds and hearts from the legacy transfer of limiting and negative beliefs? Not sure? Then you're in the right place, listening to some ideas that might help you question, understand, reframe, and rethink ideas and opinions that no longer serve you. Have you ever played hot potato? If you haven't, let me explain. You must pretend you have a steaming hot potato in your hands and pass it around, making sure to let go of it as quickly as possible so you don't get burnt. That means you have the hot potato only seconds before you pass it on. Sound kind of familiar, hmm? When you encounter an idea, opinion, piece of news, or gossip, which are sometimes one and the same, how long do you sit with that information before passing it down or around? Do you take the time to question, wonder, research, or think? Or are you so quick to inform that you pass it without a discerning thought. Now, remember the telephone game? That's where a person whispers a word or phrase into the ear of the person next to them without any repeats. And then that person whispers what they heard to the next person, and so on and so on. The gag is when the last person repeats what they heard out loud to the group. They rarely have it correct or even close. Imagine how that idea could be impacting what we pass down and around. Let's start with what's been passed down to you. At the Center for Parenting Education, Audrey Kisberg shares the power of family legacies. Every family has its traditions. Some you may truly treasure, like a big holiday gathering with extended family. Others you may truly despise, like the jello mold served at every festivity. While some you may not even realize exist. Those that you value, you hope your children inherit. Those you abhor, you try to avoid. However, what you pass down to your children consists of much more than the obvious traditions. Have you ever stopped to think about the impact of all of your day-to-day interactions with your children? All families have a set of beliefs, values, and attitudes that are passed down from generation to generation through the messages that children receive from their parents. Then these become part of the growing child's worldview. These beliefs are frequently conveyed unconsciously by parents and internalized by children unknowingly and without being evaluated in terms of their validity or truthfulness or even usefulness. They are blindly accepted. Although most obvious during the holidays, the transmission of family legacies occurs all year long through small events and interactions of daily living. Many of these legacies, therefore, can be passed along without a lot of reflection on the part of the parent. For example, You might have grown up in a house where children were to be seen and not heard. Without even realizing it, you might be acting on this idea by not encouraging or even allowing your children to voice opinions, and you may not engage in discussions and conversations with them. Without evaluating the beliefs that children should not speak their minds, you may not even consider a more open approach to hearing your child's thoughts. You simply do what has always been done. So let's evaluate some family legacies. There are positive legacies. Family legacies can be worth treasuring and passing on to the next generation, or they may be unhealthy and merit discarding. 
being aware of your family legacies can help you decide which beliefs and attitudes you cherish and which you want to make a conscious effort to change. For example, if you are raised in a family that valued together time, your parents may have taught you why they thought this was important, spent time with you and your siblings, included you in decisions about outings and vacations, and encourage you to set aside time to be with your family. As an adult, you may want to continue to teach and model this value for your own children. This is an example of being aware of a positive tradition that remains important to you and you have consciously decided to maintain. But there are negative legacies. There may be values passed down that you decide you want to modify. For example, You may have been raised by parents who were very strict in their discipline. They were quick to punish, did not allow you to explain your point of view, and used humiliation as a discipline tool. As an adult, you may decide that you want to reverse that legacy. Instead of using discipline that shames your children, you choose methods that maintain their self-esteem and your relationship with them. There can also be conflicting family legacies. Sometimes parents are at odds with each other because they each bring their own family legacies to the parenting table. It may not be a matter of one being right and the other wrong. They're just different options. Yet because parents have not stepped back and evaluated the messages they received, they may assume that their way is best and that the other is inferior. For example, You may believe in making birthday celebrations a full-day event with elaborate planning and lots of guests, while your co-parent believes in a low-key dinner with a cake and just the immediate family. With these different expectations and assumptions, disappointment or anger can easily take over. If you find yourself at odds with your parenting partner or frequently frustrated with your children, then it may be a sign that you need to look at some of your underlying beliefs. If you hear yourself repeating words your parents said to you that you swore you would never say, you can stop and ask yourself, what do I really believe about this? Once you become aware of your family legacies, you can then choose to keep, modify, or discard them. Making changes in the messages you send to your children is not always easy and can cause some stress. New behavior may not come naturally to you. It may feel like you're being disloyal to your parents because you're rejecting some of their values by doing things differently. And family members may feel threatened by and resist the changes you're trying to make. So what can you do? Well, surround yourself with people who support your growth. Make shifts in your approach gradually and thoughtfully. You want to be careful not to throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. There will probably be some parts of your family legacy that you choose to preserve even as you discard the other parts. Acknowledge the struggles other family members may have had when making changes. Remember that they may have been quite happy with how things were. Gather information about healthy parenting strategies and approaches. By replacing some of the negative messages you absorbed as a child with ones that are more in line with how you want to live, you can pass on to your children more positive messages, which they in turn can use when they raise their own children. You have the power to change and improve upon your family's traditions and heritage for generations to come. You know, we've all experienced this. I was going to say we have all been guilty of passing down unwanted ideas and traits to our children or other family members, but I don't want us to feel guilt or shame. You had limited knowledge and a lack of real-world experience to go along with your limiting beliefs. The important thing is to become aware so that you can make changes moving forward. My mother was always on a diet when I was growing up. These ideas and opinions about her image came from comments her mother made. While Grandma believes she was being constructive, the constant attention to what my mother ate and how she grew was making her overly self-conscious. Because she was always conscious about her weight or appearance, she made references to them often, 
instilling a consciousness in my own body and appearance. Was that her fault or my grandmother's? They might have just been trying to help or to get healthy, but little did they know at the time we were all little sponges at one point soaking up every negative word that was said. Deborah Farmer Chris shows how social bias can transfer from one generation to the next, found at kqed.com. From an early age, children are sensitive to social cues from adults, peers, media, and their surrounding environment. A closer look at adults' nonverbal signals, including their tone of voice, facial expression, and body language, found that children can catch bias simply by observing adult actions, according to a new study out of the University of Washington. Allison Skinner, the study's lead author and the postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington, said adults exude nonverbal signals that display their biases. And these signals create an infected atmosphere for children. Kids pick up on our cues, like how much we smile at each other or make eye contact, whether we seem warm and comfortable or cold and standoffish. This information is potentially a way of forming biases. In the experiment, preschool students watched short videos where a female actor interacted with two female targets, one wearing a red shirt and the other wearing a black shirt. The actor used identical language with each target, but she smiled and leaned in toward one while scowling and leaning away from the other. The study found that the children significantly preferred the target of positive nonverbal signals over the target of negative nonverbal signals. When they were offered the opportunity to give a toy to one of the targets, they were significantly more likely to share with the recipient of smiles and warmth. Later, the preschool children were introduced to the target's best friends, who wore the same color shirt as the target. When the children were asked, which of the friends do you like best, the majority of the kids preferred the friend of the target who had received positive nonverbal signals. In other words, they generalized their initial bias to other individuals in the same shirt color group. We know that kids readily form in-group biases. For example, if you take a group of children and put half in the green group and half in the red group, kids will prefer members of their color group, even if it's an entirely made up thing in the lab. Knowing this propensity to favor one's in-group and knowing that children absorb nonverbal clues from adults as they try to understand other groups they encounter, The question becomes, what are the messages we're communicating about people from different religions, race, and ethnic backgrounds? As the study notes, many preschoolers in the United States live in fairly homogeneous communities, limiting their exposure to different groups and their opportunities to observe positive nonverbal signals demonstrated towards such people. Because of this, even brief exposure to biased nonverbal signals against one or two outgroup members could result in generalized bias against that group. Conversely, adults can draw upon children's sensitivity to social signals to intentionally mitigate bias. So here are four strategies. Examine your nonverbal messages. We need to be aware of the messages we're giving to kids, says Skinner. How did I just interact with that person in the grocery store? If that's the only person my child ever sees wearing a hijab, what did they learn from that interaction? When children have limited contact with members of different groups, they form understandings based on these small pieces of information. With this in mind, we can capitalize on using positive nonverbal signals. Children will watch our body language as we interact with others in the checkout line or at the park. So warm smiles, eye contact, and polite interactions can help children open themselves to diverse groups. Examine your verbal messages. Adults can pay attention to the language they use to describe groups of people. According to one study, young children were highly susceptible to explicit messages about groups, even when that message contradicted their experiences. 
When children were told that a particular group would be mean to them before they interacted, that message influenced how they perceived the interaction, even when it was objectively positive. In other words, the message was more powerful than their own experiences. Expand your circle of friendship. For adults who want to help children minimize bias, diversifying your friendship network doesn't hurt and has the potential to help. One study found that mothers' participation in interracial friendships was predictive of lower racial bias in children. In these friendships, parents model and reinforce positive nonverbal messages for young children. These interactions tell them on a repeated basis that people of this group are to be trusted, hugged, and smiled at. Use books and media to prompt conversation. If children don't directly interact with people from a variety of groups on a regular basis, adults can use books and media to intentionally open up conversations about other religious, ethnic, or racial groups, tapping children's empathy and imagination. In one study, five and six-year-olds who were asked to imagine interacting with children with a physical disability showed reduced intergroup bias and more positive intended friendship behaviors towards the disabled. Another study out of the United Kingdom found that students who read friendship stories featuring English children and refugees had a more positive attitude toward refugees, particularly when the stories were paired with conversations about how these friends were similar, how they were different, Such efforts, of course, require adults to examine their own biases and to be aware of the overt and subtle cues they're sending their children. If there's a group of people you're not comfortable being around, children will certainly pick up on it. And if that's the only piece of information they have about the group, well, then it's pretty powerful. I've said it before and will repeat it now. There has been a lot of negative backlash in the media for having biases. If you just hot potato this information, you will feel guilty when any thought about another person enters your mind or causes you to question. But don't forget, we have a built-in bias for a reason. This helps us to determine right from wrong and danger from peace. Are your instincts always correct? No. Should you work to remove all of your intuition? No. You need to be cautious in certain situations for a reason. Sometimes that involves biases and some degree of generalization. For women, are all men you meet on the street at night while walking home going to rape you? No, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't cross your mind to keep you aware and on your toes. Bias isn't only dealing with how you treat others. It's about what you believe and what and why you reject other beliefs. Over at the Science Lens YouTube channel, I found more information on confirmation bias. Learn to overcome this common cognitive bias. Let's take a listen. Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Luke and this is the Science Lens where you can use science to improve your critical thinking skills. Today we're talking about confirmation bias. You know, when I was young, I once heard somebody say that one of the great mysteries of the universe is why when you drop a piece of buttered toast, it'll always land with the buttered side facing down. And at the time, I just thought it was a funny observation. But then after a few years went by and I'd seen a few more pieces of toast hit the floor, I started to think to myself, is this actually a thing? But of course, it's not one of the great mysteries of the universe. In fact, it's barely a mystery at all. I had just fallen victim to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is just giving more attention or credence to information that sort of reinforces something that you already believe in. And there are four ways that this can happen. The first is when we only remember facts that reinforce our beliefs. So going back to the buttered toast example, whenever I would drop the toast and it would land with the butter facing down, I'd have to go get paper towel, it'd make a big mess, and it took a while to clean it up. Whereas if I dropped it and it landed with the butter facing up, it was just a matter of sweeping up a few crumbs and it didn't really bother me that much. 
Now, human beings are really good at forming memories around something that's had an emotional impact on them, even if that emotion is just mild annoyance. And so what I was doing was I was remembering those times that it fell face down more often than the times that it fell face up. Next, we can ignore information that contradicts our beliefs. So for me, maybe those times that I dropped a toast and it was facing butter side up, I thought to myself, ah, that's just a fluke. That doesn't normally happen. And I would just forget about it. We can also fail to seek out objective information. So maybe if I decided that I wanted to go to the internet and get more information about this toast situation, I could choose to go to a website about data and statistics and probability, or I could go to www.thegreattoastconspiracy backslash they're coming for you dot blog. Now, one of those is going to give me objective information. The other one, not so much. Finally, I could misinterpret new information to fit with my currently held belief. So maybe if I did go to that website on statistics and probability and I found out that flipping a coin has a 50-50 chance of landing on heads or tails, I would think to myself, well, that's coins. That's completely different to toast. It's not the same thing at all. Another example that comes to my mind of somebody misinterpreting information to fit with a previously held belief is the movie Dumb and Dumber. Uh, now, right at the end of that movie, Jim Carrey's character says to Lauren Holly's character, what are the odds that the two of us are going to get together? And she says, I'd say about a million to one. And he says, So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! So he's clearly misinterpreted what she said to fit with the belief that he has that they're going to wind up together. So you can see that whether we're making breakfast, reading a news article, or even dating, confirmation bias is something we need to be aware of. But now that we are aware of it, how do we make sure we don't fall victim to it? The first step in overcoming any bias at all is just knowing that it exists and knowing that anybody can experience it, including yourself, is half the battle won. Next, when you're thinking about something that you believe to be true, you should ask yourself, what if the opposite were true? What this will do is it'll prime your brain to start exploring options that you might not have considered before and seek out objective information that could challenge your beliefs. And finally, we need to collect some data. Now, this could be secondhand data that you get from the internet, or it can be your own data that you collect yourself. But whatever the source, you just need to make sure that the data is reliable and objective. So let's round out our discussion with another example from my life of when I fell victim to confirmation bias and how I overcame it. I have a dog named Charlie and I love him to bits, but he has this one habit that drives me absolutely insane. When we go for walks and we're crossing the road, he seems to always decide that this is the perfect time for him to stop and shake out his fur. Now, at best, this is mildly frustrating. At worst, it's a little bit scary because sometimes there'll be a car coming and I really have to pull on the leash to get him out of the road in time. And I started to wonder, what is it about the middle of the road that makes Charlie want to stop and shake out his fur every single time? Of course, then I realized that I may have been experiencing confirmation bias. So the next time I took Charlie for a walk, this is what I did. I started one timer at the house to measure the overall length of the walk. And then I took another timer with me to measure how much time we spent on the road. Then I counted the number of times that Charlie shook his fur out on the footpath. And then the number of times that he shook his fur out on the road. And this is what I came up with. So you can see that when I calculate the ratio of shakes on the footpath versus shakes on the road, it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. And it's very strong evidence that I had been experiencing confirmation bias. You know, our ideas and opinions should be fluid and ever changing as we seek to understand and learn more about ourselves and the world we live in. And that world is not just made up of the planet, but the people who inhabit it. Make a commitment to explore your beliefs and push back and test. What was once true may no longer have a place in your thinking. Be open to change. That's the first step. Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist and best-selling author who explores the science of motivation, generosity, original thinking, and rethinking. Adam Grant has been Wharton's top-rated professor for seven straight years. 
Evan Nestrick conducts an interview on your ideas are not your identity. Adam Grant on how to get better at changing your mind, found at behavioralscientist.org. Changing our mind is hard, even in the most favorable conditions. There's the risk of looking inconsistent or like you lack conviction if you're a politician, a flip-flopper. And there's more to it than that. Changing your mind more often than not requires you to grapple with your own identity. Admitting that you were wrong feels personal. We have to face the facts that we've been walking around the world all this time believing in something that isn't true. Even worse, we have to admit that we're the type of person who walks around being wrong. We know what we think of other people who do that. <clears throat> how embarrassing. And yet, how freeing it is to admit we were wrong or that we don't know something. A weight suddenly lifted from our minds, like telling the truth after holding in a lie. But not only freeing, but valuable too. No longer burdened by the need to be right. We have the chance to learn something new and to better understand the world. Psychologist Adam Grant wants to make that freeing feeling easier to come by and the rewards easier to reap. In his latest book, Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know, Grant investigates why we struggle to update our ideas and opinions and how we can get better at it. The book, he writes, is an invitation to let go of knowledge and opinions that no longer serve you well and to anchor your sense of self in flexibility rather than consistency. Evan said, it's the idea of flexibility and how to achieve it that I found most compelling in Think Again. As I read the book, I couldn't help but reflect on the times I'd clung to an opinion past its expiration date, or imagine what I might have learned from a debate had I asked a question instead of hurling a rebuttal. I wanted to learn more. So I spoke with Grant to find out how we can develop the ability and flexibility to rethink. We discussed how rethinking became a part of his identity, the lesson Daniel Kahneman taught him about being wrong versus having been wrong, what he's had to rethink over the past year, and why he's no longer thinks seeing both sides of an issue can alleviate polarization. Evan opens up, you were part of a group of college students who created a precursor to Facebook. Obviously, you didn't pursue that idea, and we know what happened with Facebook. You write that the experience helped you see the value of rethinking, and since then, it's become part of your sense of self. Take me through that experience. Grant says, I remember being a relatively early adopter of Facebook the year after I graduated. It must have been 04 or early 05 that I joined. At first, it didn't even occur to me that it was similar to some things I had been doing in our e-group, connecting incoming students at Harvard. And then as it took off, I thought, you know, it seems like people are using this to connect with their future classmates. That's exactly what we did. They're also having the same kinds of conversation. Something feels familiar about this. As Facebook skyrocketed, I started to realize that I had made a whole bunch of assumptions that I just never bothered to question. It was sort of stunning to me, looking back, that it never occurred to me that a college student could be an entrepreneur, even though I knew Bill Gates had gone and done that from the same campus. It never occurred to me that I could be an entrepreneur. It never occurred to me that this was technology that might be useful in a lot of schools and for people who weren't in college, and even for people who lived in the same town. I think that that was definitely an early seed planted to say, I need to get better at identifying my assumptions as a first step, and then be willing to rethink them. Well, I hate to bring this up, but in Originals, you mention that you had the chance to invest in Warby Parker. So walk me through passing on these two ideas. What's the gap here? Grant laughs. Well, Warby Parker was not my idea. 
I happen to have one of the founders in one of my classes. So I take the blame for not seeing the potential in the idea and in the co-founders. I've taken two broad lessons from both of these experiences. One is that it's really easy to do our rethinking in the rearview mirror, to look back and to say, well, I should have been more open to, let's say in the Warby case, the idea that maybe hedging your bets and having a backup plan is a sign of intelligence, as opposed to a sign of being noncommittal. Maybe taking a long time to name your company is not a signal that you're a procrastinator. Maybe it's a clue that you really care about getting this right and you're busy testing 2,000 different naming ideas because you're going to build a brand. In hindsight, it's so clear, but it's hard to see it in the moment. I think the other thing that jumps out to me is there's always people in these moments who challenge our thinking. What I've done in too many of these situations is dismiss them because they didn't agree with me. If somebody sees an idea or an opportunity or forms an opinion that is different than mine, I should say this is an interesting opportunity to learn something from someone who sees things differently from me, and I wonder if they know something I don't. In the eGroup case, we shut down in the fall of 99, my freshman year, just completely stopped using it cold turkey. But then two years later, this is the fall of 2001, one of my roommates who wasn't in the e-group said, you know, I would really love to build a portal where people could share party information. They could get in touch with their classmates if they wanted to organize a study group. They could make sure that everyone knows about all the different clubs on campus. He was dreaming up something that looked very similar to Facebook. He did the rethinking of our e-group that I didn't do and I still couldn't see it. What I learned from that is, if somebody sees an idea or an opportunity or forms an opinion that is different than mine, I shouldn't default to the assumption that I'm right and they're wrong. I should say, this is an interesting opportunity to learn something from someone who sees things differently than me. And I wonder if they know something I don't. I guess it's been a lesson in intellectual humility Daniel Kahneman taught you a lesson about the importance of not being overly attached to an idea. Can you explain what happened and what you learned from him? Asked Evan. Grant said, I gave a talk on some of my research on givers and takers. I didn't realize that Danny Kahneman was in the audience. He's a living legend and one of the great social scientists of all time. I'm doing this double take as I'm walking off stage and Danny's there. He stops me and he says, That was wonderful. I was wrong. His eyes twinkled as he said it, and he lit up. Danny is not somebody who walks around beaming all the time, so I was struck by the reaction and intrigued by those two sentences that normally wouldn't contradict each other. Normally, what you expect people to say is, that was wonderful. I was right. Or actually, you're wrong. Let me tell you why. I ended up sitting down with him and asking him to explain his reaction. I said, I've seen this a couple of times. I've seen you make predictions. People end up running the experiment and you see something that's not what you expected. And you seem to really take joy in being wrong. The first thing he said, which I didn't capture in the book, but I will tell you because I think it's an important distinction. He said something to the effect of no one enjoys being wrong. But I do enjoy having been wrong because it means I'm now less wrong than I was before. It was a light bulb moment for me because it reminded me of what first got me interested in psychology. Being a freshman in college and reading all these studies that contradicted my expectations. But what's different about Danny is he seems to do that even when his core beliefs are attacked or threatened. He seems to take joy in having been wrong, even on things that he believes deeply in. And so I asked him about that, why and how. On the why question, he said, finding out that I was wrong is the only way I'm sure that I've learned anything. Otherwise, I'm just going around and living in a world that's dominated by confirmation bias and desirability bias. And I'm just affirming the things I already think and know. 
On the how part, he said for him it's about attachment. He thinks there are good ideas everywhere, and his attachment to his ideas is very provisional. He doesn't fall in love with them. They don't become part of his identity. That ability to detach and say, look, your ideas are not your identity. They're just hypothesis. Sometimes they're accurate. More often, they're wrong or incomplete. And that's part of what being not only a social scientist, but just a good thinker is all about. Evan asks him about the shutdown and what that made him rethink. One thing I rethought in a major way while writing this book was really fueled by what was going on politically, the both sides idea. I came in assuming that the best solution to the polarization problem was to show people the other side. I had a student a few years ago actually who had started a media company called Polar News It was going to show the MSNBC and Fox headlines side by side in the daily newsletter so that we could burst filter bubbles and break out echo chambers. And I was convinced we needed to do more of that. The traditional media needed to do it and social media needed to have algorithms that rewarded it. I've completely rethought that. I now think that the both sides perspective is not part of the solution. It actually exacerbates the polarization problem. That's largely because it's so easy for us to fall victim to binary bias, where you take a very complex spectrum of opinions and attitudes, you oversimplify it into two categories, and when you do that, you know which tribe you belong to. The other side is clearly wrong and maybe bad too. It just locks people into preaching about why they're right and prosecuting everyone on the other side for being wrong. I don't want to have both-sided conversations anymore. Whenever someone says, here's the other side, my first question is, can you tell me what the third angle and the fourth look like too? What I now believe is that we need to complexify. I think Peter Coleman's research is brilliant on this in the Difficult Conversations Lab. I love the fact that he shows that you could take the same description of an issue, like gun safety versus gun rights, and if you take the information and present it as, here are the arguments on gun safety side, here are the arguments on the gun rights side, you can get just under half of abortion opponents to agree to write and sign a joint statement together. That sounded encouraging at first, like, wow, 45, 46% of people who violently disagree about abortion after reading an article about the two side of the gun issue were able to get on the same page. Good news. Except then I read 100% of those abortion opponents were able to agree on and sign a joint statement if the exact same information about the different topic of gun control was presented not as two sides of a coin, but through many different lenses of a prism. So the arguments are basically mixed up, and you're told there are a lot of nuances on this topic. Some people who are very pro-gun rights are strongly in favor of universal background checks. Some people who are pro-gun control, they're believers in the Second Amendment. Seeing that complexity, seeing the nuances, and saying, I don't have to just belong to one camp, seem to make people a little bit more open-minded and flexible in their thinking. Evan says, Some of your research has touched on conflict between opposing groups. In one instance, you managed to do the impossible, get Red Sox and Yankee fans to like each other. Can you explain more about your work on reducing conflict among opposing groups? I have actually had some new data that didn't make the book. Tim Kundro and I recruited gun rights and gun safety advocates. We gave them a version of what we did with the Red Sox and Yankee fans. So we asked them, importantly, not to do perspective taking. Not to imagine why the other side feels the way they do, but rather to counterfactual thinking. To reflect on how, if their own life circumstances had been different, they might hold different views. In the gun control condition, we said, think about how you might have a different stance on guns if you'd grown up in a hunting family. For the gun rights activists, we said, think about how your views on guns might be different 
if you'd grown up in Columbine. That was enough to significantly reduce the animosity that they showed towards the other side or towards the opposite extreme. I think when we encounter people who disagree with us on charged issues, it's worth thinking about no matter how passionately I feel about a given issue, I could imagine having grown up in a family or in a country or in an era where because of my experiences and the people that I knew, I might believe different things. That allows me to be open to rethinking my animosity towards people who believe those things. It allows me to recognize that their beliefs have the capacity to change, just like mine could have. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they're not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, be aware of what you think and say, where it came from, what you're passing down, and what you're passing around. Seek to understand, push back, and test ideas and opinions that no longer serve you. You have the power to change your thinking. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone through until the path was clear. That's when I found.